My name's Chris. And I'm Christy. And welcome to Irish Master Chef Week, where we're doing it backwards and we're elevating the food. Oh. There we go. That is very. <laughs> doing it backwards and elevating the food. Yes. Um, <laughs> so that was dessert week. That. I'm, I'm going to say it straight up. I always fucking hate dessert week. I know you do, but this one was particularly abysmal. Look, and we've, we've, we praise, obviously, when the yes. show deserves praise. And, you know, there are some bakers we'll give some praise to in this episode, yeah. especially Adam, who had a really good week. Yeah, but, killing it. He, he's a real Irish master oh, chef, that, that lad. But, oh, of, I really... To be dis- sure, to be sure, he's a real daddy boy. I really dislike dessert week to start with, but this dessert week was not great. And there was so much that just felt off. Like, I, starters, for starters, right, it was backwards. It looked like the signature was too long for the signature time frame, so they threw it into fucking the showstopper. the showstopper, and the showstopper was then just shortened and whacked into the signature. It, it, it just, yeah. So we'll get into why in a second. Mm-hmm. We've, we've talked about these technicalities before. Yeah. Um. But I think the first question that we need to ask, and this is the, the question that you brought up, and we're not even going to mention the bloody deserted week joke. No. Because I, I actually think that the deserted week joke kind of filled a lot of the problem, which Look, was things felt slightly off and everyone felt a little bit tired. The, yeah, the, the, the joke of Natalie being the dumb one and Cal being the smart one is wearing thin. Yeah. It's, it's the same. We're going back to the same well. Like that, like that is a running gag in all Bake Offs. You know, yeah. it's fantastic. But it usually swaps between the um the the different hosts. Yeah, like Mel and Claire and, used to rotate it. Exactly, and you look at um what um Anne and uh, Alan Alan do. I was about to call him Simon because that's my <laughs> that's that's what my brain does. You know, Noel and bloody um all of them. All of them. <laughs> Well, that's the ever rotating cast. <laughs> he's a, ever he's his sidekicks of of rotation. Um, Mel and Sue, you know, I mean, they yeah. kicked off that. Yeah, and it happens. But you know, we, we've had things like where Mel does. Oh, sorry, like Claire did her um interpretive dance. Yeah, which and, you know, get, get free you know, from week. You'd expect mm-hmm. that Mel was going to do the silly thing. Yeah, no, no, Mel's doing the straight to camera bit, and Claire Hooper is in the background dancing up a storm. Yeah, or you have like Alan and Anne playing the the goofballs yeah. together. You know, it's. It's not just because it happened in the opening sketch. It also continues throughout the shed. All the way along. Yeah. So it just, and again, it's it's more the energy of this episode just felt yeah. wrong. Yeah. And like, it, it's, it's, it's my least favourite episode of this series. It's possibly my least favourite episode of Australian that I've actually watched. Yeah. And I don't say that lightly. And I don't no. say that to say the show's terrible. It's not. No. But it's... it's still better. This is still much better than most of the episodes of British that you'll see. But this was not great. You know why? Why? The party left. Well, the party did leave. You know. You know? And if you haven't listened to our, our episode with Gav, please go and listen to our episode with Gav. <laughs> he is an absolute delight. And he really is the party. Yeah. Now, look, you know... You, we, we've discussed this before when it comes to a dessert week. You're very limited because there's a lot of crossover between dessert and patisserie. Um, well, it's so broad. It, it is. And I think, like... It's for, broadly yeah. limiting, which sounds wrong, but it's actually true. Yeah. And the opening signature, signatures, like showstopper disguised as a signature, it was supposed to be about the story and what your family brought. Now... One, this doesn't set a level playing field, but they're pushing for stories, but then rejecting it when someone, say, like Galia, brings something that is a story and saying, no, that's not my, right. My, my, my rant's um, gone. You've taken my rant. No, no, no. You, no, you haven't you, taken you, my rant because no, no. I've got depth. Because if you, want, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want stories and you want, like, for me, I'm kind of seeing the, there's two things. If you want stories and understanding people's connection to baking it's not always through family like if you asked me where does my baking heritage come from what fucking baking heritage you know i have one stuffed like stuffing recipe for chicken yep. and that's the breadth and you're of, now giving that out on the podcast anyway, i know so, so you know it, it is it's the world stuffing now <laughs> <laughs> so yeah you know what i mean like i think and f- focusing on family when there are a lot of people who are new to baking. Like we look at Guillermo who came to, not Guillermo, um, yeah, Guillermo who came to baking during COVID. 
you know, there's a lot of different ways people come to baking. And I think the stories don't have to be, this is passed down from my great, great grandmother who fled Arizona. Um, <laughs> so smuggling out his cheesecake recipe between her toenails. Um, so yeah, so let's, the problems with this episode of Asked, um, as Chrissy just alluded to there, um, there are things we can do that aren't dessert week. Oh, completely. So like, what would you suggest that you, if you want to do something where we're tapping into people's baking stories, what about like loved ones week or, yeah. And I think the idea that you said was, you know, that you give everyone a bake. Um, like you, they've ever got, got a bake, mm. but you have to use flavors that remind yeah, you so, of. Yeah, so the signature could be flavors yeah. of you know what reminds you of loved ones or, or an ingredient, yeah. something of that nature. Um, the the showstopper could be a birthday cake or a celebration cake that celebrates someone that you love. Yep, and then it gives the judges a chance to you know um, share a recipe that could be passed down from the yeah. you know their their family or loved ones or that was inspired. Like for example, like um, uh. Rachel's, you know, wedding cake yes. was this was an example of that. So, so yeah. So to get into sort of the, the 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 crux of all of this, yeah. The signature. <sighs> so the signature was your family's favorite <coughs> dessert. Mm. Now, I really hated this one for a number of reasons. And the first reason I hate it is I hate an open brief because a brief this open, especially in a signature. Mm. means that the judging is absolutely arbitrary, right? There is no standard for what we are judging against here. So the way that Bake Off operates, and I know that someone's going to hit me up and go, oh, you've really overthought this. No, we haven't. Bake Off operates with three things. The signature, the technical, and the showstopper. The signature is flavours. How do you work different flavours into a similar sort of bake? And how do you adjust ingredients yes. with those flavours into... Like well-known bakes or standard the, bakes, yeah. The technical, which is how well do you understand technique and all of the the technique of baking, and how well can you adapt when we leave things out? Do you understand processes to fill in the gaps? Mm -hmm. And then the showstopper, which is all about the presentation and the way you present and the way you actually put together something to present as sort of a celebration of some description or something that's visually stunning as well as appetizing. Mm -hmm. What we got was. Do whatever you want. So not a singular thing. So, for example, we had tartlets. We had trifle. We had cake. We had an array of things that don't go together, all being judged against each other. What made it worse for me was the way they put it together was about, well, if you can match it to the, to the story part of the brief, it was fine. They went, you can do whatever you want as long as it is a family favorite recipe. Rachel then said that she wanted a generous dessert that was perfect for sharing, and Darren said that he wanted a balance of sweetness and a contrast of textures. Well, what is it? Because what if your family's favourite dessert was small individual helpings, a bit like what those trifles were, right? Well, ice cream with Milo or, or on top. ice cream with Milo, right? This is the thing. And I know you're going to go, oh, no, but they wanted Bake Off. You're being too facetious. No, we're not being facetious because they literally the left brief. it. They left it this open. And and then Rachel adds that she wants like a family, a family recipe. recipe. I'd like, like them to make a recipe. I'll quote. Yeah. I'd like them to make a recipe that's passed down through the generations. That is such an entitled way of looking at food and something that I really, we've moved away from in, in food TV. And I really disliked the way that that was used because it is so entitled. Yeah. This idea of everybody's got this food history that's passed down from general Bullshit they do. There are bakers who are watching this. There are people who have been on, as we said, Guillermo. There have been people on other versions of Bake Off who started baking during the pandemic. There are people who watch this and start baking because they really enjoy it and go, that looks really fun. They've got no baking history. Things like that make them feel like, well, I can't really do this. I don't have that heritage. And, it, yeah, it's... Like I think about someone from a lower socioeconomic background who might have, you know, come from, um, a, a like a, a, say um a, a, a parent with an addiction. Yep. You know, they haven't had that quintessential family upbringing. Yeah. They might be someone who's Aboriginal, who's, you know, literally had the lines of their families broken. Yes. When we start creating narratives like this, we start telling people if you don't fall into this story, you are you are not 
Correct. It was the issue we had with Nostalgia Week last year yeah. when they were talking about something that's nostalgic but then basically set the parameters as white Anglo-Saxon Australian. Yes. And, you know, we had this problem where we got to the showstopper and it was memories of childhood, but they really wanted memories of an Australian childhood. Yeah. With a group of people who came from a variety of different backgrounds. A lot of some people who didn't even grow up in Australia. And look, the show does much, <laughs> the show does well mm. when we talked about, and we've talked about this a few times, it does well when it comes to looking at those backgrounds. It's doing better than it's ever done. But then occasionally you get this, and I just thought, to, to, be, to be blunt, I thought this was lazy storytelling. And I thought yeah. this was looking for a, a shortcut mm. when there wasn't the need to do a shortcut. And I, I don't like, I didn't really like the cone, the, the cones. But if you'd done the cones as the signature, and made that the flavor thing, and you'd done this as the showstopper, mm. you could at least shoehorn it into some concept, and Absolutely. it would work. And you could go, okay, I feel like. I don't like it, but at least it balances and I can understand what you're going for. This made no sense. The cones as a signature, you can go, oh, you know, ice cream is a standard dessert, but we're a, we're bakers, not... Yeah, how would you bake like, something that yeah, would like, match that? That looks like an ice cream. And then you can get them to do things like, you know, yeah. bake bake cake flavours, where you say you want them to bake cake flavours that remind them of their favourite ice cream. Yeah, you got and meat chocolate challenge. chip. Right there. And, you know, bubble gum. Yeah. I mean, fucking Maggie. Maggie. Not... <laughs> no Maggie anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Let's start getting into what actually happened. Because we're going to come back to this again. This isn't mm. dumb. Um, <coughs> now, Reem said that I like dessert week because it's my favourite thing to bake. And I'm like, that's it's such a broad category. Like, I, that's why I don't like that. Laura was like, it should be a chocolate, chocolate, chip, cho- chocolate chip cookie ice cream sandwich. Okay. I'm like, okay, cool. I, Next slide, Laura. There you go, goals. Um, <laughs> so, they had two hours to make this family's favourite dessert. <coughs> as opposed to four hours to make ice cream cakes. Anyway... Um, I did like when we started, the mm. photo of Bernard was facing out over the kitchen, lording over all that he surveyed. <laughs> um, and again, Bernard, for everyone playing the drinking game at home, bang. I um, do feel like we were matching the judginess that Bernard was portraying in the I shed. did think Bernard was judging everybody and maybe yeah. he knew what was up. Yeah, he's like, I am, I am the every person. Yes. Um, so they cut to Neil. And Neil was making the sticky date cake. Mm-hmm. Not just a cake, not, not a pudding, the cake. Butterscotch sauce, sauce, sugar collar. Um, he then later on, when he was doing his decorations, was like, I'm putting glitter in everything because, let's face it, sticky date cake is not necessarily visually appealing. But you know why? It's because Darren, Darren, walk away from the MasterChef pavilion, shared fucking hall of yep. judgment. Walk away. Don't ask him how he's going to elevate it. You are, you guys asked for a fucking family favorite. Yeah. You didn't ask for like a chef's take on a family fra- yeah, favorite. Yeah, there was no we comment. We don't need to elevate it. We don't need to ask what the hero is. We don't need to no. ask what the um fucking... See, this is the other way they could have done this. How it's going to be served in domes. So the other way they could have done this was they could have mm. said, we want you to take a bake inspired by something that's your family favorite yeah. and make it something that's, you know, something else. If you'd at least done that in the brief... Great. Yeah. In this one here, it feels really. I, I one of the other things I didn't like about it. It felt so wrong for them to judge the way people made these things after saying we want to see your family. This is like going. Yeah, we're going to judge your apples, but opening it up to all apples, so you could have fucking Granny Smiths off the tree and iPods. Yep. You know, it it just felt like. But it, but even but even 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 more than that, it felt they were judging the family tradition. I know. Because they made it about the story and the family tradition. And then they were like, I like that, but I would have done this instead. Well, my family doesn't do that. What do you mean? I'm and my answer to yeah. everything would have been, no, no, that's not how my family likes it. You asked me to make my family's favourite dessert. You know, yeah. Galia did hers and they were worried about the, bis- the, the the biscuits. We'll get to it in a minute. And they then tested it and went, no, they're absolutely perfect. But it's not neat on the sides. <laughs> what the fuck? We're rewriting the rules. <laughs> Stop rewriting the rules. This You've is... been really good. This is the what's making this worse. And I again, someone's probably going to not like this, and I don't care. That's all right. What is making this worse for me is that we have actually been really good this year. Yeah. At the judging's been consistent. The narratives have been consistent. Everything's been consistent. And this is a bizarro world. It, have we entered the twilight zone? Everyone also again. Everyone just felt down 
It just felt wrong. We'll get to it in a minute. So Reem, speaking of people that had a week where they were just off. Yeah. Reem was off kilter the whole week. Um, so Mamul uh, Madbelashta, I'm fairly certain I got that close. Please correct me. <laughs> I went to a school in Bankstown. You should know better. I should. Um, now, we've had Mamul before um, in um, Spice Week um, in Series 5. They did Mamul. But obviously yeah. they did. And she was making a, um, as, she, as she called it, fake ashta, mm-hmm. which was the bread soaked instead. Mm-hmm. Um, semolina cream cake, rose water, and an and orange blossom. Yeah. Um, Adam, we cut to Adam's bench briefly, and Adam was holding <laughs> the, the Murray River salt over the bowl in a very unnatural but very sponsor-friendly way. Um, so well done, Adam. There's the, the sponsor's plug for you. But I do like Adam because he's obviously gone the Sarah Lee route, <coughs> which is our family's tradition. Yeah, so <laughs> Adam went with a chocolate Bavarian with raspberry sauce. Yep. Um, you know, everybody's got to like something, but nobody doesn't like, like Sarah, Sarah Lee. Lee. Um, so they, they made it sound fancy. Chocolate Sublet base, chocolate mousse, cream, and a raspberry sauce on top. Um, and Rachel warned them about warning about over whipping the moose, and he goes, "Yeah, I practiced it, and I did that once, so I probably won't do that again." Mm. Um, <laughs> Look, I am here for Captain Obvious, Rachel. I, I've just come to adore, adore that it? about it. Like, yeah. I'm like, I want a Captain Obvious remark from Rachel in the signature, and then we're good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Galia, so she made her chocolate biscuit pudding. Mm-hmm. Chocolate cream, cashew nuts, and digestive biscuits soaked in the milk. Mm-hmm. Now, Darren actually asked the question, I don't know how you can half soak a biscuit, but we'll find out in terms of like, to stop it from going too soggy. Darren, there's actually a fucking research paper on it. I, oh, I there sh- is too. Yeah, yeah. On how, how long to dunk a biscuit in a coffee or exactly. a tea. Exactly. What's the, what's the ultimate? So if you want to know, Darren, there's a, there's whole a research paper. There's a research paper. Um, now, I, I look, I called Reem out on this last week, so I'm going to call Sandra out on this this week mm-hmm. because I'm consistent. Uh, but I did come around to your argument and way of thinking on this. Mm-hmm. Sandra loves pumpkin, but is allergic. Yep. Um, and then also hates trifle. So she made pumpkin trifles. Maybe she just has really bad experiences. Like, we didn't get any of her story. So, well, she said she hates trifle and she they made pumpkin pie, but she's allergic to pumpkin. So it's pumpkin it's with a spice cake, orange jelly and mascarpone, walnuts for texture, infused with alcohol-infused meringue. So booze in a bake... Drink. Okay, here's what I'm taking from Sandra's bake. Okay, here's the story. She moved halfway around the world because she hated family gatherings. Yep, because pumpkin was everywhere. Because pumpkin was everywhere and it was all in fucking trifle form. Like the Canadian Thanksgiving, everything was trifle. Like the turkey (laughs) was in bits with the cranberry sauce and whatever the fuck else they have. The, The mashed potato and that kind of stuff. And the only way she could cope was to drink copiously. And so she's like, no, fuck this. I'm going to go somewhere where they don't have a Thanksgiving. Yeah. And so she came to Australia. Yeah. And so this was her ode. And she went into, she might have spilled some like tea about her family, you know, like the cheating uncle. Yep. The, um, the, the highly gambling grandma who done away like the family's, um, large, um, what's it called when they have inheritance? Yeah. You know, it's, there's probably a lot of it that they just couldn't share. So that's the story behind that's what she was doing. Pumpkin trifle. <laughs> so we cut to a loner who's making a Swiss roll in Bake Off. Um, well, maybe they like the tip top, you know, the tip top um, pre made Swiss roll that yeah. you can get. Yeah. The, I um, like the pound top cake. Top taste. Top taste. Top taste. That's it. Yeah, tip top's the, the bread. Is it the Madeira cake? That's a nice. Yes. That's an So ooh. Mike, but my, I want well, some Madeira well, cake. Well, interesting because you said Madeira cake. She was doing chocolate and orange blossom. So there you go. Mm-hmm. But my question was why the hell would you risk that a loner? Like the idea of doing a Swiss roll. Which we all know, if anything even slightly goes wrong with that sponge, it's going to crack. And not only do we all know that, but as Rachel warned Alona <coughs> about the roll, mm. Alona corrected them by warning that the bigger danger was overfilling and the fill level. So she's now doing her own critiques. Look, she's probably feeling like she hasn't had a challenge. So she's like, done pretty well for the past few weeks. And she's like, you know what? Swiss roll time. And then... And then we got a Rachel line, which, you know, made Jiggy giggle a little bit, where, where Rachel was like, yep, yeah, well, we love a filling. Um, <laughs> That's what and then come back to Neil, who at this point was starting to make his pulled caramel with the glitter in it. Um, <laughs> you know. Well, he obviously wasn't going to, and then Darren asked him how he's going to elevate it, and he's like... Oh, he put glitter in everything. By the time he finished, it was in the sauce, it was in the cream. You know was... why? Because Nat just had her... So Nat went down to the still and the um the booze cachet and emptied half of it out and just stashed all her gold leaf and shit there. That's what was glitter. Yeah. So, so 
At this point, I, where I first noticed the energy felt a bit off, Natalie was doing her bits to bench. Mm. And they just felt like filler that didn't go anywhere. And I mm. liked that. We, we both really liked that obscure comedy of the absurd. You know, the idea of... You know, one of my favourite lines from um, any like anything out of The Simpsons, one of my favourite Simpsons jokes of all time, is Sideshow Bob and the Rakes. And Sideshow Bob stepping on the rakes was the episode was short by 15 seconds. Mm. And they had Sideshow Bob step on a rake and it hit him in the face and he goes, and that was it. And they were like, well, why don't we put a few more rakes in there to pad the episode out? Mm-hmm. And it stopped being funny. But they were still short. Yeah. So they put the rest of the time into the rakes. And it's one of those old comedy edicts, but it's true. Something goes from being funny to being not funny to being hilarious yeah. it's the same and, with like peter griffin's um yeah. knee thing where he's like yes ooh, ooh, uh, yeah, yeah, ooh, yeah 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 paul rubin dying in buffy yes <laughs> ooh, ah, ee. right all of that mm. stuff but so we love that absurdist sort of comedy but this just felt off when she went to reams bench and was doing the the playing the desk drums yeah it just it was it was nonsense that didn't go anywhere and, like, it felt like we've got a gap in the episode. What do we do? Let's just put that there. Yeah. Um, it it was imposing and an interjectory, not not moving not moving <coughs> the energy upwards. And like, there were a few yeah. times in this episode where the bits with the bakers felt more like interjecting and interrupting rather than the casual banter as you go along. Yeah, yeah. And, look, it's a hard balance to strike. We're not saying it's not. But no. and it usually, usually it's bang on. And this, this is... This is um. It stands out because it's so different. Yeah, and yeah, I've just yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, as it's, you said, it's it's the whole episode. It's like you suddenly made tacos. Um, <laughs> so I thought it was really funny, by the way. Galia was using the trifle bowl. Yes, but Sandra was making, making the, the trifle. trifle. Um, now Reem, they cut back to Reem, and Reem's bake wasn't holding the shape, so she mm. was like, oh, "What am I going to do? Oh, I, I might have to put it in ramekins." So she went mm. and got the ramekins. Um, then they did the time call of 10, one minutes to go, which was fine. And then, and Adam's over there just, just perfectly yeah. creating his and then, barbarian. And of, then he finished beauty. and then he's like, <coughs> what can I do? And he came over and helped dream. And that's literally the last note I have for this. Yeah. Nothing else happened of note. Mm-hmm. Um, and even then they like reams didn't look good. They just looked like she literally got a spoon and slopped it in the thing, put a little dollop of cream. And, and mm-hmm. she even said, put a dollop of cream and like an almond and like shrugged like an almond like she was out of ideas yeah yeah. it just didn't work so let's go to the judging neil they said it was very generous definitely a family dessert well the (laughs) glitter in the butterscotch they they talked about this um and they referred to it as disco butterscotch which they then said later on uh, calvin said later on neil you suit the you suit the name disco butterscotch (laughs) that's his you um Bur- that's his burlesque, burlesque name. name. Disco Butterscotch. Fuck yeah. All right. All right. Neil will... For the rest up. of this episode, I'm only going to refer to him as Disco Butterscotch. Disco. <laughs> so it was insanely good, they said, and the sweetness was very well balanced. Mm-hmm. Um, Laura, we forgot to even... Met, I met, I, oh, my God. We missed Laura because... Oh, my God. We missed Laura because we skipped ahead to rant about something else. That's but right. Laura was making her grandmother's recipe, which she gave to The pineapple jam tarts. Yeah. Yes. And that was it was a very touching moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and they looked amazing. Yeah. That pineapple jam in the middle looked incredible. Mm-hmm. So they said the biscuits were cute and were well, was well made and her grandmother would be very proud of her. Yeah. And again, yeah, that was, that was really well done. Um, Galia. Now, they were worried the biscuits would disintegrate, but they did very well. Um, they then said it could have been cleaner on the sides. And then, again, Darren said something which sent me spiralling. It could be a little bit simple. You just ask them to make their family's favourite dessert. I don't give a fuck if you think it's simple. You didn't say parameters. No. You said make whatever you want as long as it comes from the heart and is your family's favourite dessert. And then you go, that looks a bit simple. Well, if you wanted to, to up the level a bit, set a parameter. It's that simple. What if your family's favourite dessert was like fairy bread? Yeah, like fairy bread. You could have made fairy bread, right? I really got upset with this because, look, we've... Or is what my mum liked, jam and cream. Like, yeah. just on like a we've... fresh piece of bread, she'd put some jam and pour some cream on it. Like, we've, we've, 
She's not making anything. She's pouring ingredients together. It's just, as I said, look, I've... What, there were some things where you can legitimately criticise for, and, you know, Galia has had a bit of a bumpy couple of weeks. There's no doubt about it. She's had a, a, bump, a bumpy couple Yeah, but she's been fairly but this strong is, the past couple of weeks. But this is the last couple of weeks she's been really good. There's, there's one critique in the showstopper of hers that I'm a bit near on, and there's one that feels fair, yep. which was the, the too much cocoa, which we'll come to. Mm. But this one felt like they were marking a card early. But, it really did. And this is nothing against Reem. She used store-bought bread in the in her yeah. um, in her pudding. Yeah. And I do apologise. I just don't in have it. Yeah. Mamul, sorry. Yeah. Um, whereas Galia made the biscuits. And I'm not saying, like, and but again, here I am comparing. You can't compare them. C- comparing Granny Smiths to iPods. This is know? the thing. We can't compare the two. So, Alona. They liked the way that she piped filling on top, um, <laughs> which felt desperate for feedback. Um, they said the roll was good. It was well balanced. <coughs> and Rachel said, well, I probably would have chopped up the pistachio. But what if a family liked it like that, Rachel? If a family liked it like that, like the chunks of pistachio in there, who are you to say chop, chop it up? Um, Sandra, the layers were clear. Rachel loved the the orange with the pumpkin. Um, Darren wanted it to look a little bit more professional. Um, it's trifle, does. Look, his point was put a jelly layer on the bottom and everything will set to the jelly layer. And look, that's fair. That's but, fair. That's fine. But what if her family doesn't like jelly on the bottom? That's, what if? What if I would have. I would have been such a shit in this challenge because I would have just every time they gave me a critique, I would have gone. Family likes it that way. What if no? What if jelly is Sandra's favorite, and she's like, "This is my spite trifle, and I am not putting my favorite jelly in a spite trifle." Exactly. Um, Reem. Now, <sighs> it's spiteful. The feedback for Reem was interesting too, because I know they like to be positive, mm. but it's quite clear it didn't work. Mm. But they were like, "We love the semolina crumb." The flavour is really well ba- balanced, but the, the, the only critique they came up with really was well, there was no differentiation of textures. Also, it didn't work and was hastily spooned into ramekins. Yeah. Um, and look, it's okay to say that because it happened. Yeah, it's okay to say your initial presentation idea, but it's great that you've adjusted. Yeah, you adjusted really well. That's yeah. cool. Um, there's a way to do that rather than just pretend it didn't really happen and go, look, obviously it's disappointing there, but, mm. you know, like... Oh, the flavours are wonderful and it's great, but you lose a bit of the texture. You, well, why'd she lose a bit of the texture? Because it was an individual ramekins. Because mm. that's not how it was intended to be served. Um, Adam, they said it looked beautiful. Darren said he would have it in his store. And that the mousse looked beautiful. Oh, yeah, the cross-section was gorgeous. Oh, it was wonderful. The tartness came through really well. The chocolate mousse was perfect. And Darren said it was the best thing he's made in the competition. And you can't really argue that. No. Um, so the technical. Um, if you thought I had a few, only a few notes <laughs> on the signature... I have five <laughs> on the technical. But don't panic. I've got something for you, folks. Rachel's instructions were light hands, clean lines, make it sing. It is a hazelnut and tahini opera cake. Two hours and 15 minutes. And they have kept on referring to the coup twist. Are we trying to make coup twist a thing? Because if we are, I don't want it. No. Right. I don't, we don't need to say it's a coup twist. It's a twist or it's a different, it's a variation on an opera. Fine. Mm. We don't need to gimmick it. Um, also, do we, did we, did we need to remove the coffee element of an opera cake, which is a staple of the opera cake? I get what they're going for. Do something a bit different. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we always had like, say with Matt, Matt and Maggie, I mean, we had one of the classic examples, Moran Lamb Wellingtons. Okay. Yeah. You know, we've had, classics that have been changed in the past I, but the whole I don't know maybe everything so far has just tainted my I, look, take on this I'm gonna tell you straight up our, our, our view on this episode we the, we normally find the light really easy and yeah. it's, it's hard in this one because I think we were so put off by just the, the balance so mm. but let's find some lightness shall we um yeah. so they added the tahiti buttercream instead of the coffee one. Now, Rachel suggested it's an opera cake because of the aria of flavours and textures. 
Okay. Let's take a historical walk. You got, you got a deep dive for us. So too? I've got a deep dive. So this is from I used the website Bacon as a reference, which is a really good website for a lot of the background of this stuff too. <laughs> and look, the history of the opera cake is ridiculously checkered. Like really hard to even nail down. Even more than the pavlova. It's it's even more checkered than the checkerboard cake. <gasps> oof. So oof. it's really hard to nail down the actual it's origins. A cake with a there is a past. yeah. There's well, there's an eighth. There's an eighteenth century, a nineteenth century reference to something along these did lines. It, did it come from the wrong side of the Paris tracks? No, it came did, from very much the right side of the Paris. I was going to say, did it walk the walk the wrong ruse? No. So let's go to it. <laughs> so. Contrary to the popular belief, there is controversy to its origin. Mm-hmm. Um, some um, refer back to um, Sir, um, Cyric Gavon, who worked at the esteemed Delio shop in Paris. According to this version of the story, Gavion invented the cake in 1955, inspired to create a dessert whose every bite would encompass all its flavours. So she's sort of right on the multiple flavours thing, but that's an opera cake, right? Okay. But it's not called that because of that. The chef's wife is said to have suggested the name opera because it looked like the, palais, the stage at the Palais Garnier. Which is in the Paris Opera House. Okay. Which is the, which is the Paris Opera House. Right. So the reason it was called an opera cake wasn't because it's an aria of flavors. The flavor thing is true. It does have a multitude of flavors in it. That's an opera cake. Mm-hmm. But it's because it looked like the stage at the Palais Garnier. Okay. That's the, the rationale behind it. Now, confectionery historians also suggest that it was born in the kitchens of the pastry chef and um, candy maker Louis Clichy during the 1903 culinary exhibition in Paris. Mm-hmm. He introduced the Clichy cake during the exposition. And this is basically the starting point, and then the opera cake was born from, from this cliche yeah. cake. Yeah. But the naming of it seems to be because of the stage at the Palais Garnier, which is the the, the French opera, house, the Paris Opera House. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's called an opera cake, not the aria of flavors. Although waxing lyric, all you want. <laughs> now, also as bacon <laughs> devotees will know, mm-hmm. normally an opera cake has the word opera written on the top of it. There are only two bakes that have their name written on them. Okay. So, and I was hoping to see, I was wondering if you'd remember the second one. We've seen them both. Okay. So, Opera Cake is the first one. Yeah. And traditionally, they write Opera on top. Yes. The other one. Yes. Canadian did it, um, and it, it was in particular, it's a Kyla Keneally one because she oh. grew, she, she went to a Swiss You've asked, bakery. Yeah, speaking it's, of Swiss, I my know. brain is Swiss cheese. It is. The sack of tort. Oh, yeah, that's was, true. They write Sacra across the top of it. That's right. Right. So normally you would have opera written across the top of it. You know what This they, is very important are? information, by the way. Those Go. two cakes are the Jason Derulo. Of they the really are. They announce themselves, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or the DJ Khaled. <laughs> opera and Sacra. Um, <laughs> Jason <laughs> Derulo. Yeah. Or like DJ Khaled. Like, opera <laughs> Khaled. Jason Derulo could never get away with crime. <laughs> he just announced himself as walks he walks in the door. Bank. Jason, like ima- imagine Jason Derulo going to a brothel. <laughs> no. Automatically, everyone's going to know it's him. I was like, is that guy look like Jason? He walks in the door. Jason Derulo. There's no, there's no shame in seeing a sex worker. There is no shame. In I seeing just seeing don't a sex think worker. you need to announce yourself. There is no shame in seeing a sex worker. However, yeah, TMZ would have a field day. Oh, true. Okay. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's not so much about, you know, his, you know, on his shame. It's more TMZ would have 15 million people making phone calls going, well, he announces himself. I wonder if he announces himself while having sex. Or when he's going to the supermarket. Like, while while he's having sex. While he's having sex, it's like, uh, Jason Derulo. No, what would be even worse? Public bathrooms. Oh, no. (laughs) He walks in. It's one of those timed doors. Yes. The timed door (laughs) opens and as he steps out, Jason Derulo. <laughs> anyway, that's mm. the most Jason Derulo talk we've ever had. Um, mm. Why haven't said, we done this before? When I said Bake Off devotees will note this, mm. um, season one, episode seven of the Great Canadian Baking Show, it was the mm. technical. Okay. Season three, episode 10 of Australian, it was the signature in the grand final. Cool. In the Olivia grand final. Yeah. Um, in British Bake Off, season four, episode nine, it was the showstopper. So it's been a technical, a signature, and a showstopper. Also, it is Australian is the first one to do it twice. Cool. So, look, my point with that is not that opera cake is not worthy, mm-hmm. but especially when you're going as broad as dessert week, yeah, you probably could have done something different. Mm. Like you could have done anything. Literally, you could have done anything. It's, <laughs> it's in the name. <laughs> um, so, these are my notes. Mm-hmm. We bake a jacon. 
We chill a jaconned. Yes. We fill a jaconned. Exactly, we did. Yeah. Bake, and then you squiggle. chill, fill. And then squiggle on top. <laughs> just, just you know, it, it becomes blackboard. Yeah. Upside down. Upside down. <laughs> so, <laughs> my notes. I hope someone holds up the piping bag on their nose once. <laughs> <laughs> Enters the, <laughs> the bake off shed in a little. Here's Mr. Swiggle. Yeah, in a little rocket ship. Um, the piping bag stuck out the front. Yeah, so bake, chill, fill. Mm-hmm. Cal then sang a note. Yep. Uh, um, no, I think it was several notes. There were several notes <laughs> banded together. Um, <laughs> Galia sugar, sugar syrup crystallized, so she redid it. Yep. And that was minimum fuss, by the way. She just went, oh, it crystallized, I'm doing it again. Mm. Um, Neil, who said. The trick is, I'm going to hurry the hell up. Mm-hmm. And then the one, the, the joke that Natalie did that really did work in this episode, the, the one that I'm like, okay, that was good. We got the highlight of the episode. Was Natalie going to the benches gathering the offcuts? Now, we started <laughs> by her just walking over to the bench and picking them up. I mean, she really, she's like, Mel Bottle, hold my beer. Yes. <laughs> and then yeah. she got the rolly chair. And just starts scooting around. I'm fine, thank you. Just gathering up the stuff and then getting all of them. She's got armfuls she rolling around. She had a tray as shed. well, didn't she? Yeah, like tray the and oh, all no, of the it was off- a cooling rack. Yeah, cooling rack. Um, and then she came. They, then then Cal goes to do the time call, and she just rolls backwards into the time call, going one hour to go with an armful, of, <laughs> an armful of baked goods. That was really good, right? That was the mm. highlight. That was probably it was probably the joke highlight of the, yeah. the entire episode. Um. We then made a big deal about piping on top in a circular motion. Mm. This isn't an actual design thing, guys. This this is a Rachel Koo invention for this challenge. Right. You could have done any fucking pattern. Could have done dots in yeah. small round dots. You know what you should have You know what you could have done? What? Could have written the word opera. <laughs> or just ooh. 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 Like when they said do O's. Just do do a K. Right, Koo. Ooh. Write coup and put a twist at the end of it. It's a coup twist. <laughs> yes. So um, the, the clean lines meant, you know, basically you warm up the knife before you cut. Mm-hmm. And then we used the last of the gold leaf that Natalie had left in the steel to, to, to dangle on the corner. Mm-hmm. That's the technical. That's that's it. Uh, the judging. Galia. Clean lines. They were even. The hazelnut sponge was airy. The tahini was lovely. But the chocolate ganache was a little bit too thick. At the top. Neil, they said they were very squiggly circles. Who gives a shit? His layers were inconsistent thicknesses, though. Yeah, that's that's more of an issue. That's more of an issue, but the flavours were good. Mm. Um, Laura, the buttercream was thick. The tahini buttercream was really good, uh, and it was well-balanced. Adams had a great shine. The portions were spot on. <coughs> they said it was an excellent opera cake. Mm. Uh, Reem, the layers were there. The edges were not super clean, but the flavours were really good. Sandra's were a bit too short, apparently. The ganache wasn't as shiny, but the flavour was good. And look, Sandra talked about that because they made the ganache with butter and she's like, I don't normally make ganache with, with butter. So that was something that was... Yeah. Different for her, yeah. Yeah, and Alona, they said they were generous in size. The flavour was there in good texture. So the order was from last to first, Sandra, Neil, Galia, Laura, Reem, Alona and Adam. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Adam, charging ahead. Adam had a great episode. Exactly. He's like... Bring me the Irish Master Chef. I will elevate and fiddle dee dee. <laughs> fiddle dee elevate. The showstopper. Now yeah. I'm going to read exactly as I wrote it down. Mm-hmm. Decorated ice cream cake pops. Oh fuck. Now, as regular listeners will remember, um, last year we had the biscuit pinata in patisserie week. In patisserie week. Because as we all know, when you go to the great patisseries of the world, you're really there to buy a biscuit piñata. Yep. Yep. You're there to buy something which is a giant representation of, for example, the baker's face. Um, (laughs) Or, you know, a a, a pink donkey. Or, you know, like... Yeah. Again, I hated the piñata. The execution, what the bakers presented, fabulous. This is not on the bakers. No, and we've, the we've choice for the theme in Patisserie Week was unnecessary. It was just and not. this is the thing: our critiques of all of this stuff is nothing to do with what the bakers have done. It's what the brief is or what the, the guide is being given for this episode. 
The decorated ice cream cake pops may push the piñata really hard. Um, cake mixed with buttercream or ganache dipped in chocolate. Two flavors, six in each set. Now, I actually had a question while it was going, mm-hmm. um, and, we'll, we'll, and we'll get to it, But because they did actually mention it then in the judging, which was, but I'd like to know, like, everyone... And there's no secret about this. Everyone has to sort of ahead of time come up with what they're doing for their show stuff and they practice them. We all know that. Now, Alona did the same cake for both of them. Yeah. That's and I know true. she changed the other flavors up around it, but I would have assumed that the, the main it, thing was the cake. The cake. And so the cake flavors. should have been different. But I would have assumed that that might have been something that came up when talking about, I'm going to do my show stopper. Yeah. And these are the cakes I'm going to do. Well, what cake's going to do? I'm going to do the devil's food cake. And. Yeah. What are your two flavors? What are your two flavors? So, that's a a brief question for me. Like but we, again, we haven't we've had this before where someone's made like one batter to go through. Yeah. You know. Or yeah. So it. But, but we but we've got a a brief, a brief that says two flavors. Yeah. So again, how do you define what is the flavor profile of this? Yeah. And that's confusing on its own. Now, we then got the feedback from the two of them. Um, I would like a crisp and crunchy cone. Nothing about the cake, just Rachel just wanted a crisp and crunchy cone. Fair enough. Um, and and um, Darren wanted innovative design, but the cake was the key, so he remembered the cake existed. Mm. Um, they had four hours to make these. So all of this, right, the instructions about flavour, the uniformity of it all, the fact that it's individual portions, it just screams signature. It's a signature. You know what the signature should have been? Six cake pops. Yeah. And, and don't worry about the cones. Do them as cake pops. No, but, but you can do them as cones, but do six and do them in the two hours they had. Because yeah. they had four hours to do 12. Yeah, and, and take out the um the need to do chocolate because yeah. that's unnecessary. Top them however you want. They need to look like ice cream, yep. you know. Do it as an ode to ice cream. Yes. So we then went to Corner Talk, which is, mm-hmm. as we all know, very quickly become my least favourite thing in the world. Yeah. Um, Adam was absolutely crushing, but we all knew this. Mm-hmm. Then they said that Neil's should be good because he tends to be good at this sort of stuff. They didn't talk about any other baker or what they'd done well. They said that Neil should be good at this. Neil came second last in the technical. This is a chance to talk anybody else up and go, oh, such and such was, was fairly decent in the signature. You know, someone you haven't spoken about before or someone that you wanted to sort of go, hey, this wasn't too bad. This showed a bit of promise. Or I'm really looking forward to seeing what Adam puts up because he's been strong this episode. Yeah, well, they, well, they talked about Adam to start with and yeah, just yeah. said he's great and he's great and he should be great. Mm. But then they just went, oh, like, Neil is really good at being creative, so he should be good at this. Mm. But it's who they asked who has been good. Yeah. And, like, it wasn't, like, his first cake was fine, but he was second last in the, in the technical. It's a chance to talk about someone else. Neil, and again, I love Neil, and I think Neil's brilliant, and I think Neil has... Sorry, you're getting... Dis- was it glitter... Disco. Sorry, sorry, I forgot. Disco You're butterscotch. Right. You're right, disco butterscotch. I love disco butterscotch, and I think that disco butterscotch has had a great series so far. But disco butterscotch has also had a lot of coverage. Yeah. And you could rotate it a little bit and talk about someone else here. Mm-hmm. Um, then we go, who hasn't been doing well? And they go, well, Galia's not doing very well. And they go, well, even though she sort of did well in the first one, it was too simple. We go back to this too simple thing as why she's not doing well. That's not fair. No. Not fair at all. Um, they did say then her technical was out of balance. And she was third last in the technical. But there were, there were two that were worse. So She was middle, wasn't she? How many bakers are well, left? Well, there's only Six? seven. Seven left. She's, you know, like, she's like just under she the... She was five of seven, right? Yeah. She, she, was mid, she was middling. Um, and they then went with Reem and they were like, oh, we felt sorry for her because her signature didn't go as planned. And this isn't anything against Reem or any of the bakers about to talk to here. No, 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 judging issue. But the review for Reem having her first bake fail Mm. was sympathetic. Yeah. Which is, well, fair. I have no problem with them being sympathetic over that. But they criticised Galia's for being simple but then were sympathetic because Reem, who admitted that she was doing a, a, a cheats version of it and doing it a different way of it, it didn't work. And they were sympathetic to her, but critical of Galia for doing something simplistic. Um, and also, 
Sandra's signature was a bit messy. And in the technical, she had split ganache and was last. But they didn't mention Sandra. No, not at all. And again, that's not wanting Sandra to go home. No. This is just the inconsistency of this segment. The story in this whole thing is that everyone but Adam was having a middling middling week. You know, we all have it. We all have times in our lives where it doesn't matter what we're trying, what we're trying to do. It's just not going to plan. And that's fine. You know, and Adam was a clear standout. He was very strong through all of it. Everyone else, like Alona was off, Neil was off, apart from his disco butterscotch. Yeah, disco, disco, disco. Um, you yep. know, like it, it wasn't, no one was really outstandingly strong. No, so, nobody was. Apart from Adam. No, nobody was really strong. Yeah. It was kind of all over. Adam ran away with it. And, and so the story is, we're looking at their performances overall. Like we have to remember... <coughs> You know, we've got a loner who's been star baker, what, twice? Yeah. We've got um, um, Disco Butterscotch who's been star baker. Yeah. Um, Reem who's always been solid and bringing stuff to it. Laura who you barely knew existed for much of this episode. I know. They, they got They got Laura. Laura cried at the start because she mm. was obviously and remembering her grandmother. Legitimately, not, not, a yeah. fake, not fake tears. She was upset at the start and then you didn't really see Laura for a large swathe of this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, she just sort of disappeared into the, into the middle distance and never to be heard and, from and, again. And this is what's frustrating is that we're getting unnecessary host like, cuts to the hosts and we're not seeing the bakers. Like, yeah. This, this show, we want to see we the bakers. We didn't. So one of the things we talked about early on with the idea of that corner talk segment is mm-hmm. you can do so much work with the bakers and at the same time like move that story along while you're getting those little critiques. And that was... Something that people were like, well, that might be a positive, is rather than stopping and talking at the table and then starting, it just moves on. Except we're now so focused on Darren and Rachel and then Cal and Nat doing the what do you think they're saying, and then they got Rachel and Darren to do the what do you think they're saying. I don't care at this point in time if the episode is going so much better and the narrative's good and we don't feel like everything's being rushed or forced then that joke's great. But in this episode, it just felt like we were padding for time. This is this is a ploy in MasterChef. Yeah. You've got, say, one of the chefs, one of the judges being goofy off in a corner, two of the judges having a serious discussion, and then they have back and forth, yeah. right? And they've got to do it because there is a lot... There's a lot of time. A lot of time going on in MasterChef. Um, and usually, you know, what, 70 days in a week. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> So it's, it's, it doesn't work in a bake-off format. The cut to the table slows it down, brings us back to what bake-off is. It's, it's, a TV it's, ver- it's a TV version of your local fate. Yep. Now, the CWA are not standing in the corner while the, you know, their comrades are working on the pumpkin baking. scones, yeah. While they're working on the pumpkin scones. Oh, look at Ethel. Oh, she's, she's decided to use butternut this, this time. I, I, I just feel like she hasn't been strong all week. Oh, did you see Marjorie? She didn't pat down with milk. Oh, tisk tisk. I know. They're doing that at, over a cup of tea. Or, and, and being super polite and yeah. saving that kind of talk. Moving, moving away from the table yeah. moves you away from that chill ethos. Yeah, of just having a chat. And, and makes it feel a little bit more cutthroat than you want. Mm. Like, mm. not overly cutthroat. I wasn't there going Darren and Rachel are trying to execute bakers or anything. But it just doesn't feel as warm when they do it that way. It, yeah, it just... It's clinical. And, and it's gossipy bitchy. Yeah. You know, we've all been that person who's And they play there. up to that with the what do you think they're saying over there. I know. Like, all of us at some point in our lives have been doing something that's a little bit vulnerable, a little bit... You know, like putting yourself out there, and then you look across, and there'll be two people who are just like snickering behind your back. Now they're not snickering behind your back, but they're still critiquing. It's got yep. those vibes, and especially in a week where the first thing you got them to do was bake something that's apparently close to their family. Yeah, and then you're like, well, we're standing in the corner, and well, what? Well, how do you think they did? Well, I think so and so's family bake was really shit. <laughs> you know, it's just, but they're not that saying that, but that's how it yeah, feels. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I would have been deeply insulted. By a bake again, I come back to that point. Mm. If I had a bake that was was something that my family really treasured, mm. and I presented it, given the brief of present something that's close to your family and is family favorite, yeah, and I was told it was simple, yeah, 
I would be deeply insulted and hurt. If you're asked to bring something that is your family favourite, say you've got like, is it Iceland or, yeah, I think it's Iceland who have the um the fermented shark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Half rotting shark, essentially. Oh. And you're like, you're bringing and, that. And Sweden to, does, you know, yeah, go watch uh, his that, way. Yeah, the, the, just the stinky fish, right? Yeah. And you bring that up and everyone in your family likes it. Like if we are bringing up, like say, Vegem- Vegemite. Yeah. Like, you know, doing cheesy mite scrolls or something. And a, a judge just went, fuck you, that's <coughs> shit house. Yeah. It's like, you insult me, you insult my family. We're coming to you with the horse's heads. Exactly. Like, <laughs> so let's me, get into the... Let, in let's, the bake off shit and insult my family. So let's get to where I would like to be for the rest of this. And then I pull out my mandolin. Nice. So let's get to where I want to be for the rest of this, which is talking about the bakers. Mm. Um, apparently my family's now Calabrian. Apparently. <laughs> so so Sandra begins by telling us that she's putting bourbon in the ganache. This was part of the booze in Sandra's bake. It wasn't all of the booze. <laughs> there was rum. There was bourbon. She goes, I'm making a real boy's bake. No, you're just making a bake that everyone is. Yeah. It's a real boy's bake. And then later we find out there was ruby chocolate in it. <laughs> yeah, they, at no point did they mention the ruby chocolate. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah. Adam was making movie night cake pops. So painted macaroons mm-hmm. with red velvet. Um... Dark chocolate and crushed popcorn with mm-hmm. popcorn cake and peppermint. That's and a lot, a lot when they talked about, you know, hey, I'm going to infuse it. And we'll talk about that infusion in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, Reem. So Reem decided that she was going to make cats in cake pop form. Because um, they're always around her while she's baking. I know the feeling. Um, <laughs> they're always around you no matter they're what. They're just always around there's, me. There's one with us now as we yeah. podcast. <laughs> the antisocial one is with us right now. Um, oh, look, just because so, his name's Senator Porpatine and... He's, he's not really got the control of the Senate yet. So. Not yet. So, white so chocolate. Be emperor. White chocolate, chamomile tea and raspberry, and dark chocolate with astragalus tea cake and blueberry. Now, they said to her, oh, we know all those flavors, but do those flavors go? And Reem's response was, the flavors by themselves work together. Doesn't answer the question, Reem. The flavours by themselves work together. But here's a young woman who, over the past few weeks, has brought us some really cool flavour combinations that you would go, guava and what was it, peanut butter or something? Yeah, I'm not doubting her actual flavour combinations. I I would be like, ooh, Reem, what have you got for us this week? And she could, you know, ask questions that are going to prompt people... To explain and I not think, and not I know, I, I, I'm, not I'm, doubt I'm, themselves. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt on this one because I think that question was designed for her to say, "Yeah, I've tested it, and there's a really nice balance between this and this. You know, mm. do those flavors work together?" Yeah, it was more the way that she said the flavors by themselves work together, and I'm like, that doesn't actually make any sense. They can't by themselves work together. It doesn't work, Reem. Really. That's individual, it's holistic. A, it's, it's, a, a, it's a juxtaposition. It's a juxtaposition of tone. Um, anyway, um, disco butterscotch. Living together. Disco butterscotch was then using champagne, <laughs> um, which terrified Laura when she's there. It's like, we're doing this with a pop, and Laura's like, who's shooting? Um, <laughs> she comes from the streets, man. It's all good. The answer was disco butterscotch. Um, so disco butterscotch was going with rum and raisin with caramel. Mm-hmm. And then strawberry jelly and champagne mousse. Yeah. So that was where um, Disco was putting the, the, the champagne. Um, <laughs> Sandra. Yep. So peanut brittle topping, mm-hmm. stout cake with chocolate and bourbon ganache, blood orange cake with raspberry Swiss meringue. Mm-hmm. Just a bit of booze in that one. <laughs> I really love, they cut over, the, so everyone's doing their own thing and they cut over to Sandra and she goes, I'm looking at my peanut brittle. Mm-hmm. And that was the cut in, which I really love that one. Um, <laughs> Then we got what I'm referring to as the hashtag only bake off sentence of the week. Yeah. Which goes to Adam. So the popcorn has steeped in the cream. <laughs> yeah. That is the only bake off sentence for the week. Because where else on the planet are you hearing the sentence, the popcorn has steeped in the cream? By the way, this also raises something. Yeah. So Darren Purchase said, because mm. cause, um, Adam said that they said about, I was, um, Rachel said to him, yeah. You know, taking the popcorn and like Dipping scooping it in the, ice, in the cream. ice cream. And Darren's like, we don't do that over here. Uh, uh, D- 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 Darren. Darren, not only do we scoop it in ice cream, like not everyone. Shirley, have a word with him. Yeah. Maltesers. Yeah. Maltesers and popcorn. That's my go-to. Like a couple of Maltesers, 
couple of bits of popcorn. Oh, beautiful. And I've spoken about it before, that, that dessert my mum made, which was popcorn mm. with caramel inside, chocolate on top. And Darren, I'm going to blow your mind. Going to blow your mind. Chop fudge ice cream from Macca's. Dippy chips in it, mate. Did yeah, that blew your mind when you found that one out. Yeah. No, no, I knew. Th- it was that was the cookies. It was the one. The thing. cookies, the cookies blew my mind. Which I was staggered that you knew the chip one, but you didn't know the cookie one. Because I, I got, I stopped at the chips. I'm like, I, I'm not going to elevate this. <laughs> How can I elevate this? Yeah, surely have a word. Anyway, um, now I'm going to do cookies, chips, and ice cream. So Laura, now Laura mm. did um, an upside down cone with hazelnuts. So it was hazelnut cake and black sesame ganache, mm-hmm. which was supposed to be the sort of sad. The cone has fallen over and splattered everywhere. Yes. And then the happy cone, which was a white chocolate and raspberry with a lemon cake and a passion fruit curd. Mm-hmm. Now, they're standing at her bench. Yeah. And they look into the curd and they're like, um, is that passion fruit pulp or is the air, or is it sort of become eggy? Eggy, yeah. And she's like, no, no, it's passion fruit curd. And like, yeah, good. Can say it's passion fruit curd. Um, <laughs> and spoiler then alert. go away, tip it out and start again. Yeah, spoiler alert. Um, <coughs> it was it's, egg. It's, it's passion fruit flavored um, scrambled eggs. Um, so Neil, sorry, disco butterscotch. Disco butterscotch. Sampled his own food, mm. stopped, looked at the camera, and just went, "That's perfect." <laughs> I am here for the disco butterscotch gloating. Yes, because he's not gloating in a mean way. He's no, like, he's "Just like I'm good. That's good." Yeah. And I love what I love about disco butterscotch mm. is that he loves sharing that when it's really good. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, they cut away and he ran around the the, the shed with that pot, going, "Anyone, anyone, taste who it, wants, taste it, who taste wants, it, taste it." Um, Galia. So she was doing a, a sort of a vanilla frosting, a lemon cake with blueberry cream, mm-hmm. and then a black cocoa waffle with um, raspberry infused dark chocolate cake. Yeah. Now. They said that, but when they get to the judging, they say that that one's a bit too heavy on the chocolate and, co- and cocoa. Mm. I'm here for it. As a lover of dark chocolate, Yeah, I am here for that one 100%. Yeah, you want to, you like things bitter like your soul. I really do. Bitter like my soul. My coffee, coffee. is black like my heart. Yes. Um, then we go to Alona, and they're like, what are you doing? Because they're making the devil's food cake. Um, and they're like, ah, the devil's food cake. Yes, we've seen this cake before. And she has, and she's very good at the devil's food cake. And she did yeah. make it earlier in this series, and mm-hmm. everyone absolutely loves it. And at this point, you could sort of hear the judges almost saying to themselves, "Are we going to do a different thing? No, we're going to go with that again." Okay. They flavored with ma- mandarin jam in one and almond butter in the second one. Um, so this is where I asked the question before they got to the judging: Is the accompanying flavor enough? Or should you probably have done two cakes? Oh, definitely two cakes. It was very, it, it was inference. But when someone says, you're on a baking <coughs> show, someone says, I want two distinct flavours. It, and it's a cake. It's you, You'd think that the major element of that is the cake. You know, the waffles are just a container. And I was really interested that not many, I think someone did chocolate waffle cones, but that was the only kind well, of. Well, Galia did one. Gali did one. Like there wasn't a lot of change up in the flavor of the waffle cone, um, but so the cake needed to be the the main part that you had the differentiation in the flavors with. What was really interesting about this was that mm. it had the flavored man- with mandarin jam in one and the almond butter in the second one. But then when she they were testing them, if you remember, Alona said that the bottom of one of them was like coconut rough when they yeah. cut it open. Mm. But that wasn't in either of the descriptions. No. So I don't know if there was a change after the description or what. Because mm. that confused me. Because then she said, yeah, when she said that, I'm like, uh, uh, okay. Um, we did get an, a Cal time call that was quite good, which was, we are halfway through a gritty Norwegian crime drama. <laughs> you are halfway through your bake. I hope no one dies <laughs> in your thing. <laughs> See, th- there were some beautiful moments. It just, yeah. It didn't balance. Then... Mm. It's time for everybody's favorite favorite time of the week. Yes, it's that That's science. science. <laughs> Sandra lays out many pairs of gloves. Now this was off the back of the other week where she was wearing three, three. layers of rubber gloves to insulate her from heat because, as Cal said, it's not like oven gloves are a thing. No. Cal then comes into shot, mm-hmm. goggles, high vis, gloves, and a fire extinguisher under the arm. <laughs> it's safety, Cal. Then science safety, Cal. We got a fight over the dowel. <laughs> Which was brilliant. So you got Cal all, you know, safety up, and Sandra there, and they're fighting over the dowel. And then we got the sentence: you have to squeeze the tip hard. 
and we were out at that point. Yep. So that science needs to be its own little series. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. Um, then that brought over tablecloths for Neil with the oh, sorry, disco butterscotch um, with the with the waffle press to get him to iron some of the tablecloths for them. Yeah. It, it, I like the concept. I just felt it again. There was a bit of that interjection, like unnecessary. Yeah. At this point, it was a cute concept. Yep. Yeah. Then Galia, but this is the thing. So we got those, but that pause there, and like mm-hmm. that, that was in there. But then we just got Galia saying that her time management got away from her again with ten minutes to go, and that she was out of frosting. But she clearly recovered and did it, and it was fine. But we didn't see that, and then we were done. So like then at the end of the episode, the end of that challenge just sort of went. 100 mile an hour from nowhere. Yeah. So the judging, uh, Disco Butterscotch. Um, they said it looked decadent um, and it was yum. The champagne mousse had great flavour. The The cone was a bit softer, however. The rum and raisin had a punch of rum and they liked the thick coating of chocolate. Mm-hmm. Reem, they looked fun and inviting, but they were, they were dripping slightly. Mm-hmm. Adventurous with the choice of flavours. The chamomile was subtle and they said that she was trying to do too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the astragalus... Um, tea cake was lost flavor wise completely mm. but the presentation was good yep. um and we'll come back to that in a minute as well because this they, when they get to the the, the galia description so mm. <coughs> sandra well presented the dark chocolate bourbon ganache was great well tempered good flavors um laura they said the passion fruit and raspberry was bright but the curd was very eggy the black sesame though was very good and the cone was really crunchy yeah alona the cake worked well with the mandarin and the cone was crunchy. The cone was good, but then the way that Rachel put it was, the cake is too familiar. And mm. they basically said to her, you need to do something else. Yeah, yeah. Um, Galia. Mm-hmm. Now, I started off by complaining that they were too large. Then they said they wanted a reference to the flavours on top of the cone. They did not say that no. to any other baker. No. Right. Reem did cats. Were her bakes cat flavored? <laughs> right. Out of respect for Reem, I'm going to keep my smutty mouth shut. Please do. Um, but nobody else put like a fruit on top to signify the flavors. Galia did a, a, a rose as the whip on top, like an ice cream. It mm. looked like an ice cream. Mm. Um, the lemon was delicious. They asked her. They said that she should have added fresh fruit. And then the cocoa on the second, they said was too much. And again, they said. Fresh fruit. Cut back to Reem, who put blueberries in hers, and they said the flavours were too much, and the astragalus got lost. Mm. It confused. Mm. Um, Adam, they said the presentation was excellent, the popcorn cake was fun, the mint worked, the red velvet was well balanced. Um, Look, Adam had a perfect week. Yeah, absolutely perfect week. Uh, and I don't want our disappointment with the episode to take away from the fact that he Adam's was fucking weak. brilliant. And I was so happy for him. I'm like, finally. It was like after the technical where he said, apparently, he goes, I didn't really know what one was. I hadn't seen one before. I did it. Apparently, I can bake. <laughs> yes, you can, Adam. This was this was your week. Mm-hmm. You could have said it. You would have got away with it. Um, no, he didn't. Now, and he did. When they got to the table, mm. they basically said at the table that Galia was probably going home. Because she'd been there several times. Mm. When they said at the end, they went, look, Gogali's back here again in this position. Mm. And that was really the only differentiator they had. Yeah. So I get the feeling that Galia went home due to just, she's been in the bottom a few times. Reem had a misstepped week and they sort of went, well, galia has been down here a little bit more. But then when we go back to say um, Felicity's week. Yeah, they ignored that altogether. They ignored that altogether. So again, it's like the inconsistency is yeah. annoying in this episode. What wasn't inconsistent was Adam, who is no. Star Baker and was Star Baker by a mile. Probably the most look, Neil's was a really clear Star Baker from everyone else in the week that Neil got it. Yeah. This might have actually been further clear than that. Absolutely. It was so obvious who the Star Baker was. Mm. Galia goes home and look, I've occasionally been critical of some of her time management and, and things like that. However, what we've said is that the last couple of episodes in particular, she's been very when she's had to bake for her life, she's, she's done a really good job of it. Yeah. And I think she goes away from this episode with her head held high. Absolutely. I think she, I think she did a much better job than 
they gave her credit for in this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, probably still just the right decision, but hmm. I Reem was incredibly fortunate this week. Yeah, um, Look, I think she banked a lot of. She banked a lot of credits. She banked yeah. a lot of credits, but and that's fair enough. Like I, I'd like to see more yeah, from Reem. Exactly. I have, and again, I have no no issue with that whatsoever. And again, none of the elimination talk is about the bakers. It's no. about what the judges are doing. Yeah. And it's just that consistency. And look. I'm hoping this is a blip in the system. Every series every series is allowed to have an episode that's a bit of a... Yeah. Yeah. Like we said, the episode, um, the Bread Week episode this year was meh. It wasn't bad. It was just mm. flat after what was an amazing biscuit week. It was a flat bread week. It was a flat bread week. Um. Then it's there sort was of no been, leavening agent. It's been good again. This <coughs> is a decided drop, and I'm hoping this is the last one, and that we're yeah. back up next week, which is, I believe, Citrus Week. Um, That's really cool. Like I, I do like it. It's almost like an Iron Chef moment, you know, where where we've got a the secret ingredient. Yes, secret ingredient. You know, and now, it's not we, specifically eggplant or king crab. But it's what we need citrus. is, but what we need though is an opening shot of, of Darren Perch just like eating a, a red capsicum raw <laughs> and just laughing in the, a yellow capsicum raw eating and laughing into the camera while we pull back on the shed. Yes. You know. And then can we have Cal and Nat and um as coming up as the Iron Chefs? Coming up as the Iron Chefs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would be absolutely brilliant. I'm here for that. If you want to do that absurd in, intro, do it. Yes. Um so that's it for this week. Mm. Um sorry if it's a bit if, if people find it a bit of a downer, but we look, we say all the time we are absolutely honest with what we think about the show. If the show is something where we're like, it needs to be praised because it's been brilliant, we'll tell you. But if we personally, and you might have loved it, and if you did, please tell That's us. That's great. You know, but, and, you know, I'm but, happy to hear why. Yeah, but one of the things is that we are always, and we've always maintained this from day one, we are always open and honest with what we think about it. Yeah. And this episode, I think, while some people might go, it's a bit harsh, I think this is kind of what it deserved. Yes. So Mm -hmm. until next time, I'm still Chris. And I'm still Christy. And we will catch you all later. Disco Butterscotch.